Um, I want to let you know that we send out an email on Sundays or Mondays, and I'll be happy to share it with Mankato. It includes the readings and a link to the videos we use, as well as this part of our service, which is when I speak a reflection and then when folks respond to the reflection. So that part of the service is recorded, and I want to say that ahead of time just in case you are camera shy and the last thing you want to be is on our recording. Um, and then we post that on our YouTube station. So I will send that off to Rita and perhaps that will make it into your hands or not, but know that that is something that we send out on Sundays. So I often say that attending a Christian seminary helped me confront my own prejudice and broke open my single story about Christians. I'm not proud to share that I had created a monoculture or an all-consuming stereotypes of Christians, which legitimized my prejudice, of course. What I learned in seminary, or perhaps more adequately, I would have to say what I was reminded of in seminary, is that there are many Christians I know personally and church communities that I admire because they claim and live out the same values and beliefs that I hold. I also learned that there's a vast amount of difference in what part of a predominant theology each person believes. I don't remember having judgment or concern about my Christian friends in high school or in college. I lived, when I was in high school, on what was called Church Row in town, and so it was like the whole road was just church after church after church after church, and so on Sunday mornings, the parking lots filled up, and I just remember, you know, it was, it was a neutral thing to me. People went to church. I've been reflecting as I've prepared this sermon, and I would say that there are two things that made me begin to reject Christianity prior to seminary. I would say the first was attending weddings and funerals of loved ones and hearing language and metaphors that made me extremely uncomfortable. I've actually now come to realize that there is language that's used in conservative Christian settings that make my Christian friends extremely uncomfortable. And the second thing that contributed to my rejection of Christians, I'm not happy to say, was being a member of UU congregations for a decade prior to seminary. Yep, this is not easy to say out loud. I love our pluralistic faith that is open to a spiritual journey with vastly different theological perspectives held together by common principles and beliefs and values. Perhaps it's our own limitations as human beings or an instinctual drive to compare and to create labels of good or bad, legitimate or illegitimate, realistic or superstitious, which are really the problem. Although the ministers in the UU churches I intended included biblical stories and God language, I picked up some vibe that we Unitarian Universalists had evolved in our thinking to a place that is superior to Christian believers. Saying that into my computer screen feels really rotten to me. I cringed when I heard the, the words this week about teaching American exceptionalism in our schools. Yet, exceptionalism has been named as one of the three errors of Unitarian Universalism, along with individualism and anti-authoritarianism. I'm really grateful for my call to Michael Servetus Unitarian Society. Our Mankato visitors may not be aware that Michael Servetus was an offshoot of First Unitarian Society in Minneapolis, which is known as one of the flagships of early humanism in the country. When the search team asked me about my personal, personal theology, I named religious humanism. As I gained a greater respect and connection to liberal Christians in seminary, I found myself growing less comfortable with the word and concept of God when I was surrounded with classmates whose faith was God-centered. Actually, when I interviewed with the Ministerial Fellowship Committee, I confessed that I was uncertain about my belief about God, and they still let me through. Let's hear it for Unitarian Universalism and our evolving questions in faith. 
Upon my arrival to MSUS, some folks sniffed out that religious part of my humanism and they would have none of it. Others, actually most, continue to approach this spiritual journey as a multifaceted one. There are places where the language and the descriptions of who we are at MSUS create conflict, especially for those who want, who want to use more traditional religious language and for those who traditional religious language pushes buttons or triggers. What I've learned over my years of service is that humanism is not monolithic either. Stereotypes that I had of Unitarian societies proved to be more complex and once again, undeserving of my prejudice. However, I also see a real danger of our small but mighty congregations of diverse faith perspectives perpetuating the humanist exceptionalism that denies all in our congregations the respect and honor they deserve. I have to imagine some of what I speak about is alive at your Mankato Fellowship as well. I tell you all of this because it is the background to my own subjective perspective when studying the humanist manifestos. To pretend that I come to sermon writing objectively would be disingenuous. I wish I could ask how many of you have read the third humanist manifesto written in 2003 titled Humanism and Its Aspirations. I wish I could be in the room with you and see how many hands are raised or heads nod in agreement. I have to say, if I've read it in the past, I don't remember the document. William Murray, who has written several books on humanism, identifies three interwoven strands in humanism. Scientific curiosity about the origins of the universe, a commitment to happiness and the common good, and a sense of skepticism about the supernatural. So let's step back into history for a minute. Unitarianism, which is rooted in, Boston, in the Boston area, started with questioning and defining a faith without a damning God and hell. It was a faith founded on the Cambridge platform, which put churches in relationship with one another in a non-hierarchical way through covenantal promises. It was an intellectual faith, which, Harvard with, which was led by Harvard men predominantly. And as any faith that is open to continual revelation and change over time, it was often challenged from within. Major skim, skim, schisms in the early years were driven by the transcendentalist and then later by the humanist. The transcendentalist were men and women who were part of the inner circle of Boston, where the humanist movement started in the Midwest. First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis um, with Reverend John Dietrich at the helm, who served in the early 1900s, continues to be a hub for humanism in the country. Dietrich's colleague, colleague, Curtis Reese, held the pulpit in the Unitarian Church in Des Moines, Iowa. It's said that both of these men were out of favor with their colleagues in the East. The 1920s was a period of growth for humanism, and in 1933, the first humanist manifesto was written. I wish there were time to dive into each version of the manifesto in order to uncover the nuances that changed over time, but it's not really feasible on a Sunday morning. Perhaps it's better suited for a class. In an article on the three manifestos, Henry Morris provides the whole historical context for the, all three of them. He said the first one, well, he said the first one was written at the, the, the beginning of a humanist um, movement. And um, the second one came in 1933, which was 40 years after the first. The writer of the second manifesto saw our first manifesto as too optimistic. Imagine looking at an optimistic document in the early 60s and early in the 60s and early 70s when America was confronted with the evil of Nazism, when we watched regimes move into totalitarianism, when we saw the civil rights movement. Oh no, so that was all what was happening in the 1933. 
Oh, wait, sorry. Man, I'm just getting, but you can tell it's like Sunday morning and I'm not 100%. Um, so look at looking at the 1973 document, there was already the 40 years of the civil rights movement, the fem feminism, Kent State, and the first Earth Day, Woodstake, Woodstock, and Watergate. I know we think these times are churning, but let me just say we have churned in the past as well. The 1973 manifesto shifted from an optimistic document to one that had some of the more perhaps darker or shadow sides of us included as well. It included comments about racism and sexism and the misuse of power. It included thoughts on the direction of social policy, which might remedy some of these problems in the world. All of these sort of thoughts were resting on the first tenant which was a rejection of God and a reliance on human beings to make the world what we will. In 19, um, the most recent manifesto is brief. And what I love about it is that it includes strong but perhaps less degrading language towards those who are theist. Unitarian Universalism is constantly changing but in 1998, when there was a survey around the beliefs of Unitarian Universalism, humanists were the largest percentage in our denomination. Now we're seeing an emergent of Christian UUs. Um, one of our end statements at MSUS that we are focusing on this year is to articulate and explore our Unitarian Universalist faith identity as an intergenerational community, learning as we live it together in the world. So actually, I'm so excited as I dove deeper into humanism because I can see that there is clearly a need for more exploration if we are to ident claim our identities as humanist or Buddhist or Christians. It will be fun to study together and to see where we all land on these different continuum, continuism, continuums and thought areas. So. What does that mean in a church community where all paths are honored? One of the key criticism of humanism is one that's directed at Unitarian Universalism as well. And many of you must have heard this. It's that we are too optimistic. Humanism is also critiqued as lacking a spiritual dimension and ignoring emotional and feeling parts of human beings. William Schultz, who was a, the UUA president in the past and is a well-known humanist, speaks of his confrontation with despair when three of the formative adults in his life died in quick succession. He said, I found the world a far more bleak and lonely place than the brave words of the manifesto would allow. He, along with others, have named these types of um, pieces that don't exist in the manifesto as real limitations. As Jan, John Saxon wrote, many of us felt, although it affirmed the freedom of belief, it was often dogmatic and intolerant. I read a piece by an unidentified speaker at the UU Fellowship in Armorello, Texas, and he wrote, I wish it wasn't relevant, but I need to start by acknowledging that I was raised a humanist. As a child, I was taught to question, taught to scorn superstition and blind faith, taught that reason and science were the only ways to find any kind of truth, and that God had nothing to do with living well. It was a chilling, bracing kind of way to raise a child. In Sunday school, we did not sing about Jesus loving us, and no one taught us how or why to pray. We were expected to clarify our values uphold our individuality and pull ourselves up by our own theological bootstraps. I cannot stress how incredibly white and masculine all of this was, but back then pretty much everything was defined by white men, so that was not unusual. And as I became a teenager, this is what I rebelled against. Just the other night, we were in our last series of transgender um, inclusion in congregations. I don't know if the Mankato Church has done that series or not. And Reverend Michael Slack, one of the leaders, spoke of intolerance in our congregation. He was said, um, 
he shared that one of the things that really drew me to Unitarian Universalism was the theological diversity that was written about, right? But the moment I shared that I was a Christian, this basic, this person basically laughed and walked away from me. That was deeply harmful. That and many other experiences relative to that. It's had a real impact on my willingness to show up as my full self in UU spaces. I shared this because I believe we need to be really careful in our own search for meaning. We need to find ways that don't discredit others or that by claiming humanism as our root system of a congregation, we don't deny or turn our children sour when it comes to positive understanding of other faiths. Last week, Rita, Reverend Rita, spoke about an equally complex theology called religious naturalism, and many of the authors I read more recently spoke of a merging of religious naturalism and humanism. Saxon writes, I believe that naturalism can breathe new life, passion, and meaning into religious humanism and rescue humanism. And more importantly, I believe that naturalism can provide the common ground on which we can build bridges between the theological differences that sometimes divide humanists and pagans and theists and Christians in UU congregation. It's interesting thinking. Bill Schultz um, has come to talk about how the basics of humanism, and some could argue the basics of Unitarian Universalism have pervaded our larger culture. Um, I think that, he, well, he's, he says that it is not particularly important to me anymore whether I or any else, anyone else uses God talk. What is of supreme importance is that I live my life in a posture of gratitude that I recognize my existence and indeed being itself as an unaccountable blessing, a gift of grace. Sometimes it's helpful to call the source or fact of that grace God, and sometimes not. But what's always helpful and absolutely necessary is to look kindly on the world, to be bold in pursuit of its repair, and to be comfortable in the embrace of its splendor. I know no better term for what I seek than an encounter with the holy. Just like we heard Peter Mayer, everything is holy now. I want to make sure that I don't just talk about humanism in the abstract. I really think that final manifest, well, the most recent manifesto, which was written in 1973 and included uh, one of the writers was Kendall Gibbons, who used to serve First Unitarian Society in Minneapolis, they, they got that down to one page and six statements. So I'm going to urge you, I will actually include a link to look at that document. And I think what's really interesting as you read the six statements is to compare them to our UU principles and ideas. So I just want to, I'm going to just cover the first sentence in each of these statements so that you can hear what is included in the third manifesto and see how it resonates with you. The first statement is that knowledge of the world is derived by observation, experimentation, and rational analysis. The second is that humans are an integral part of nature, the result of unguided evolutionary change. Third, ethical values are derived from human need and interest as tested by experience. Ethical values are tested by experience. Fourth, life's fulfillment emerges from individual participation in the service of human ideas. And fifth, humans are social by nature and find meaning in relationships. And finally, working to benefit society maximizes individual happiness. I want to just add a description following that because I don't know about you, but individual happiness didn't feel like a very deep goal to me. Um, but what they say in terms of the concept of individual happiness is that we seek to minimize the inequities of circumstance and ability, and we support a just distribution of nature's resources and the fruits of human efforts 
so that as many people as possible can enjoy a good life. So there's both a sense of the land belonging to all and has that kind of, need I say socialist, since it's been used so much over the past week, but that idea that we must share the fruits of human effort so that as many as possible can enjoy a good life. The last paragraph of the third manifesto says, thus engaged in the flow of life, we aspire to vision with the informed conviction that humanity has the ability to progress towards higher ideas. The responsibility for our lives and the kind of world in which we live is ours and ours alone. William Murray in Reason and Reverence writes, religions that don't encourage questioning and independent thought are ill-suited for transformational forces in society. I want to I want to say that one more time. Religions that don't encourage questioning and independent thought are ill-suited to be transformational forces in society. There's something about that continual looking at oneself and questioning um, that makes it relevant within today's society. Humanist is defined in the third manifesto, certainly meet that challenge. I want to share a statement once again that's included in that third manifesto just so that you can continue to hear the language. It says that humanists are concerned for the well-being of all, are committed to diversity, and respect those of differing yet humane views. We work to uphold the equal enjoyment of human rights and civil liberties in open secular society and maintain its civic duty to participate in the democratic process and a planetary duty to protect nature's integrity, diversity, and beauty in a secure, sustainable manner. I have to say, for all I love about humanism and all that I read, there is an intellectual barrier, perhaps, in the way that a lot of their statements and ideas are articulated. And I can see how for many who follow other faiths where the language may be simpler and the um, threads may be um, pulled from uh, theological texts that many can study together, that there, there is a barrier to humanism as it's articulated here. So I, I look forward to our congregation and perhaps Mankato's congregation taking time to study humanism, to, to cherish the way it's written and to find a way that we can live it and translate it into our own lives and into the work of the world and be able to articulate it to others in a way that might offer a bridge um, as people of faith and people of deep values. So my prayer, yes, I'm a humanist who prays, is that we as congregations and as a denomination continue to wrestle with how to stay in covenant and in right relations while being encouraged to explore and name our own religious belief and philosophy, philosophies. Only then can we aspire to be what we declare we want to be. May it be so. And amen. So I apologize, it got a little spotty there at moments in today's sermon, but you know, sometimes that can happen. Um, so my questions are, did you hear things that might confirm your sense of being a humanist, if you're a humanist? Um, are there reflections that kind of came to you as you heard some of the words from the manifesto? And I would ask that, as you speak, to use I statements. So instead of saying, you know, yeah, everybody believes blank and I believe this, just start with the I believe. And then that way it doesn't necessarily uh, diminish or challenge other people's beliefs as you assert your own. So for you Mankato folks, we do this just like we do joys and sorrows. We open it up and folks have an opportunity to reflect on either what they heard today or their own um, journeys in terms of humanism. So I'll open it up. I see Byron would like to say something. Um, 
I think so. So I definitely live and think by those tenants that you um, that you read for us. And thank you for um, reading those again. It was good to hear them again. Um, the last thing you said really resonated with me, and that is, surely we can rewrite these so they don't sound so much like a philosophy course. And I think we really can. And I, I think it would be helpful to put them in much more inspirational and aspirational language and then put them on a wall. That would be a really um, a fulfilling activity. Uh, so if that happens, I would like to be a part of that. Wonderful. I think it's uh, I, I think this will be the year, Byron, where we'll dig deeper. And um, I would love to see a translation that's more accessible <laughs> and inspirational and a inspirational, as you said. Yeah, a translation into human. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Looks like Jamie. I'm unmuted. Okay. We can hear you. I'm Jamie Hubbard. And um, Jamie, lean in a little bit more just so we can hear you better. I'm Jamie Hubbard. And um, I, I believe that I did not hear any mention of feelings. And I have heard in the past how Unitarians sometimes disparage that and see the intellect. As the, um, as the superior part of our being. However, feelings are very important. They give value to intellectual content. They help us make decisions. They do a lot of things for us. And they really work hand in hand with the intellect. So I think that that needs to be added. Thank you, Jamie. I haven't studied deeply, but my guess is that when they speak of science, it's not just physical or biological science, but it would also be psychological and sociological. But it's so, the language, as you said, lacks that clarity around feelings. Um, so thank you for that observation. I'll read what Marilyn wrote, and then um, Lynn, you can have chance to say something. So Marilyn wrote in chat that she believes that the combination of humanists or humanism and Christianity are where she finds herself at this time. So Lynn? I have enormous respect for the values of humanism. I, I share a lot of those, but I am a UU Christian. <clears throat> and I have to say that, that um, in the trans, transgender inclusion series, when Reverend Michael gave his story about saying that he's a UU Christian and, and someone just walked away from him. I have experienced that and it is really um, difficult because there are common threads between liberal Christianity and humanism that, that we need to explore. Um, so that's, that's my hope. Thank you, Lynn. I think your dog agrees. <laughs> And I want to say I really value um, the brave Christians in our congregation who, with a great deal of grace and mercy, have shared such experiences, Lynn. Kathy, I see your hand up. Hi, uh, the people, um, I'm a member of the UUA Board of Trustees, um, as well as being a member of MSUS, and as the MSUS folks know, uh, as of General Assembly, the UUA Board has commissioned a study group to rewrite Article 2 of our bylaws, which include our purposes and principles. And one of the um, clear uh, criteria we've given that group is to come up with language that's more poetic and inspirational. So to Byron's point, we're aware that that needs to happen. And I encourage everybody to keep track of this process as it's going to start to get underway in the fall. Uh, because that rewrite um, is going to be the first time since the mid 80s that we've done a substantial rethinking of what our principles mean and certainly um, 2020 is not 1985. <laughs> so pay attention. 
And we will make sure we pay attention, Kathy. And I'm, I'm so excited because it feels like um, an incredible time in Unitarian Universalism. And so I, I feel like it's a really ripe moment to have statements emerge. Um, and I really look forward to hearing what they come up with. And other, and it also sounds like other um, folks are going to be working on the theology of Unitarian Universalism in a way that can be broadly distributed as well. We just have a few more minutes or another minute if anybody has anything they'd like to share. I see Kathy. Kathy Brynard from Mankato. I'm here with my husband, Tony Filipovich. But I wanted to comment for me, um, I don't identify with any ism, but the, mm -hmm. the living tradition, the expression of the living tradition that we have as Unitarians embodies for me the parallel contributions of the whole range from the direct experience of the transcendent, you know, through the prophetic words, the traditions of Christianity, Judaism, all those things to me, for me, function in a parallel way and enrich my own, um, my own experience as a living spiritual being. Oh, Kathy, I love that. Thank you for bringing the living tradition into this conversation. And that's very much part of um, the Humanist Manifestos, and it's part of Unitarian Universalism as well. So I really appreciate that. Beautifully articulated. And man, do you have a lot of books. <laughs> Byron, it looks like you have one more, and then we're going to stop. Yeah, just very short. So um, I love the room that we just saw. That's a beautiful room. It's a beautiful metaphor. Um, so thank you for, for that. Um, I'm not sure how to express this, especially quickly. Um, I guess I would call it an appeal. Um, I'm putting out an appeal to the UUs in MSUS who believe in God and are willing to try to explain their belief in God. I, I know that's a rare bird that I'm asking to meet, but I would love to sit down with um, thoughtful people who are also brave enough to try to explain to somebody else why they believe in God. It's easy to find the, um, I guess, the cradle, the cradle Christians who believe in God because they were taught as a young child, and they just do because they do, and they're, you know, deep in that culture. Um, so I guess that's it. It's an it's an appeal that discussion. That's what I seek. Thank you, Byron. We're going to close this section and move on. Uh, we'll have Jess join us now. <laughs>